Valor Magulis. Welcome back to Southside Westeros. I'm D. Paul, your master of whispers, and I thank you for joining me again on a journey into Game of Thrones. Today's episode will be whether Sirio Pharrell was a faceless man. Now, this is a juicy, tantalizing subject that has been the subject of voracious debates. When I first looked into this subject, I was like anyone else, a fan. And I enjoyed the character of Sirio Pharrell. And even though we only saw him for three episodes, his effect was profound. And we felt it all the way into the last episode. Now, Miltos, I can't say enough about the level of professionalism in his performance. You believed he was Serio. In fact, I think he played that role so well that it'll be difficult for you ever to look at him as anything else other than Serio. Uh, quite a few characters on the show uh, put that much in to their character, but he in particular is one that resonated throughout the audience. Um, now, to break down the type of character he is, you really have to know what he was. So, initially, Ned Stark was brought down to King's Landing to be the Hand of the King because uh, John Aaron was poisoned, supposedly, and Robert Baratheon, the sitting king at that time, could only trust a very few, um, including his family. So Ned Stark was really the only choice at the time, even though that may not have been the best choice for Ned himself. That was the only choice at the time. So a man like Ned, when you look at him, understand that he's like a CEO. I've said this before. And as a CEO, he works 24 hours a day at his job being the Lord of Winterfell. And now I'm also the Hand of the King, which basically I'm managing six kingdoms. While a few are itching towards open rebellion. So this man doesn't have a lot of time on his hands. However, to be the type of person he is, he needs to understand the limitations of those around him. Now, when Ned looks at Aya his youngest daughter. He can tell she is nothing like Sansa, his oldest daughter. Sansa is your proverbial Middle East, um, not Middle East, but mid evil young girl, raised uh, to be a lady, raised from a young age to be a wife. Now, it's not that they're not doing this for Arya. She just has no interest in it. She never wanted to be a lady, and she never will be a lady. And Ned recognizes this. But because of who he is and the honor and the duty, he has to try to keep her on the path of being a lady. However, as a good father, he recognizes that this isn't who she is and she's going to keep rebelling. So let me try to give her some scraps, something nice, kind of like John did when he gave her needle, which brings us to Serio Pharrell. So as he's in King's Landing, he recognizes that. Now I is even more unhappy because everyone around her in King's Landing is going to want to push her to be a lady more so than the rugged North and Winterfell. So he sets this up, Serio Pharrell, who he refers to as a dancing master, the master of water dance. Now Serio was originally from the free city of Bravos. Bravos is the Rome almost, of Westeros and George R. R. Martin's world. Um, some would say the original. Uh, you would liken Bravos and Essos to Europe. Westeros would be more like the UK. And so Bravos, he spent nine years as the first sword of Bravos. Now, this is a, a position of extreme honor, duty, and you have to be very skilled to be the first sort of bravos bravos is the center of the world and quite honestly the center of their financial 
world. So you would assume that someone who is the first sword has to be very good because everyone from the entire world would want to converge on Bravos to take their wealth. So it wasn't just the Golden Company that scared people. It was the first sword of Bravos. Now, reasonable people would say, well, what did it take for Ned Stark, who is from Winterfell and for the last 17 years is whispered as the helper of the usurper, Robert Baratheon, how he can have the power to request a first sword of Bravos to be a teacher and a babysitter to a young girl or a boy, a boy, as he would say. So this begins the first kind of twinge in most viewers' eyes. Like, this, this, this guy's like a general, you know, right? He's, he's like, he's the guy. And, and you can get him to come and babysit a chick? You know, this is not me saying this. This is what people would say. She's a girl. Which, you would think a guy from Bravos is even more traditional than some of these people in King's Landing. But he's going to come and teach this girl, okay. So that's the first place where you think, well, he, he can't be the first sort of Bravos. He has to be something else. There has to be this other reason why he's come to teach Aya. But you see that Aya takes to this man very quickly. And this is something you'll see over and over again during the course of the show. Aya is looking for a father figure. And then one would say, well, wait a minute, how? She had Ned Stark. I mean, look at how good a job he did with Rob and John and all these other people. But she could not have the benefit of that because she wasn't a boy. So these other men who also are not traditional, and I'm sure you, you know this, but we're, we'll go over for a second. These other men are not traditional. And that's the appeal because they're not traditional. They're not going to make me be traditional. So Aya takes this man right away because he wants to teach her everything that she wants to learn that no one will let her learn. Basically, how to kill people. <laughs> it is what it is. But <sighs> but we, we see this relationship and it's a very quick relationship, but it got deep and profound right away. And it comes to a head after I uh, let Ned Stark know how deeply she likes this. So as a father, he's happy because something he did made a child happy, but there was a twinge. Go back to that scene where she's kind of rambling on about at the stairs when they're rambling on she's talking oh i'm gonna go catch cats and serious is this and serious is that serious is this and all fathers and parents go through this like oh you like this person better than me but he's the father so he he has the the joy of discipline and all those things which he actually is going to be looked upon as his children with a little bit of anger you know, you're so mean you're not letting me do what i want to do you won't let me eat candy till i'm sick and but Serio just teaches you all the awesome stuff. So Ned is listening to this, and he's happy. But he's also like, hey, I'm, I'm Ned Stark. I'm your dad. I, I fed you. I protected you. Look at me. But that is the indication that this is not going to go on very long. And it's a common theme for the rest of the show that this is not going to go on too long. Any happiness that you have is going to be fleeting. And there's going to be something right around the corner. And this was no exception. So let's fast forward to Eddard's arrest. And now the Lannister guards, led by a despicable character, Marin Trant. And <laughs> he did what he was supposed to do. But they come to find Aya. And she's in the middle of her dancing lesson. And Sirio, being a sort of bravos, understands the art of war, he understands tactics, and he understands engagement. And he can see in these men's eyes, this isn't, this isn't right. Marin Trant, with 
five guards come to get a little girl. So he puts Aya behind him, as any man would do. And he kind of tries to get her to go away. But Aya, being who she is, picks up her wooden sword. And we're going to do this together. No, 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 Aya. So he uses his wooden sword, disarms these men very easily, immobilizing all of them. With a wooden sword again. Think about this. This is the first sword of Bravos. And then he engages Marantrant, who breaks his wooden sword because he has a broad sword. This is about 20 pounds. Um, Aya doesn't want to leave him. She tells her to come with him. And he tells her, the first sword of Bravos does not run. And then Aya flees. And then off camera, we hear more fighting and screams. Now, it is assumed and implied that Serio is killed at that point. Now Aya goes on about her business. We fast forward to season four. And Aria believes that Serio is dead. And then she tells the hound that he was killed by Marin Trout. Sandor Kiglain. <laughs> Kiglain is this in all his glory. Proceeds to mock Serio. <laughs> Because he's like, if this guy is the greatest swordsman in the world. Now, this is not what he said, because he's only described himself as the first sword of Bravos. But Aya, in her adolescent mind, looks at him like he is the greatest swordsman I've ever seen. Because all I've ever seen are savages hacking away at each other. But this man has grace and balance. And he can move through a crowd like a ninja. So he, to me is the greatest, and Sandor is a very pragmatic character. He says, please, Marin Trout is horrible, and if this guy was as good as you say, he can beat three Marin Trouts, okay? So then we fast forward to season five, where Aya begins to exact revenge and starts to go through her kill list. And she finds Marin Trout in a brothel, Stabs him in his eyes, stuffs a rag in his mouth, and then before she kills him, she tells him, I'm here for revenge on Serio. Now, if you noticed, and most people may have or just may have been caught up in the emotion of Aya being able to get revenge as a, as a young girl in the medieval times, as a young girl in a feudal system who was a second-hand, a second-hand citizen who went through uh, oh, traumatic and horrific events, lost her parents, has been on the road by herself, went from a very well-off girl to a, a homeless woman living out in the woods, um, hoping for the kindness of others. She's now exacting her revenge. But if you go back to that scene, he's mumbling and he's and he's trying to say something. Now, this could be just... He's in immense pain. He got stabbed in his eyes. He got stabbed in his side. He you know, he's pretty much knows he's getting ready to go. And he went from the aggressor to the victim very quickly. What was done to him was what he has done to people for many years. But I believe he was trying to tell her something. We don't know what it is. It could have been I didn't do it. Or it could have been I'm sorry. Or it could have been just please don't kill me. We'll never know. Now... Aya then meets Jagannagar, who turns out to be a faceless man. The faceless men are assassins, from, also from the city of Bravos. And when she meets Jagan, and she tells Jagan that her dancing master was from the city of Bravos, he kind of smirks. And he says, a dancing master is a wonderful thing. But a faceless man, well, <laughs> that's something else. So because of the Bravosi connection and because of the way these two men felt a need to protect this young girl that neither of them knew, there was no real motivation to protect her other than the honor that sat inside these two men, proposed honor. Because one would think that Ned, being a wealthy man, probably paid hefty, hefty price to have a dancing master come. And 
this actually is an insight, and we're, we're going to break down Ned Stark in probably a two- to four-part series coming up soon. But for this man to have the knowledge of Serio and to respect him enough, or maybe he didn't respect him. Maybe he thought this was, you know, just a, a bunch of useless dribble and it was something to keep Aya busy, maybe. But again, to get a first sword of Bravos, you had to pay a, pay a pretty penny. So it's a lot. You could have gotten the Master of War. You had people like Sir Roderick that were all around King's Land. You could have got anybody. You know, you could have got Sir Ellen Payne. What are you going to do, talk back to you? <laughs> Badoom, boom, sorry. <laughs> but for him to go out and get this man from Bravos and and I would assume that he had to travel there. I don't see a man like Sirio Pharrell just kind of moving around in King's Landing, especially a man who was eccentric and confident in his movements and words. He was fearless, but also flamboyant, which is something that probably would have gotten him into a lot of altercations in King's Landing with these, you know, almost savage people, even in the Red Keep. Um, and a man who, if you saw how he disarmed five Lannister guards, you would assume that he is a man who demands and commands his respect. So he would have gotten into several altercations. So I don't believe Syria was running around in King's Landing. And also, he, he had an aversion to cowardly and weak acts, which caused him to stand up to Trump because he felt it was cowardly and weak to scare a little girl. I'm a man. Come do it to me. <sighs> but again, you only saw this man for three episodes. And in those three episodes, Serio was the one that actually shaped Aya's personality, which would ultimately lead to her killing the Night King. He started it. He started putting those things inside of her, letting her know that just because you're a female does not mean you can't be a great swords person or swordsman. That Westerosi combat, while effective in some circles, is hacking and hammering. And it lacked elegance, precision, and sometimes intelligence. And he put that sense of honor inside of her that would serve her well later on. This is why he was so disgusted by Marin Trant's men. How can you threaten a little girl? Where are your cojones? Where is th that honor inside of you that allows you to put on a gold cloak? And he was obviously a charismatic man, and this is inspired. This is what inspired Arya after his death. Um, and then motivate her to kill a grown man. Now, for her to do what she did and go through what she went through in that um, brothel before she exacted her revenge, it uh, you can tell how this kind of, you know, put her on this path of revenge. And then you go to her meeting with Jag and Hagar and everything he's done for her. Now, this is where we get into my opinion on this. Whether or not I feel that he was a faceless man. Drum roll, please. No, he was not. And um, Miltos actually referenced this um, in a panel after the show concluded. And now if, this is where we go back to the book, because in the book, there really is no connection between Serio Farrell and Jag and Agar. That connection was written into the show. So the short answer is no. There's absolutely no connection between them per the creator of this world, George R. R. Martin. And that connection that was put in the show, I think, wasn't, um, it didn't serve to do anything but confuse you, smoke and mirrors, to add some mystery and endear you to the plight of Arya, which... George R. R. Martin has said was one of his favorite characters. And his wife actually referenced this in an interview where she stated, I was very upset at George for killing you off, killing off that character. So that's the long 
short story. So now if we look, let's, let's look at the TV show by itself. We'll take the book out of it because if we reference the book, we can kind of shut down every argument and every podcast will be four and a half minutes. So we got to stretch this out a little bit. So we're going <laughs> to, we're going to go into just the show. So now we look at the show, the show itself kind of gives you that character, but I don't believe so. One, if Serio was a faceless man, well, you know what? Let me give you a, a example of why it could have been. If Serio was a faceless man, then it explains why Marin Trant wasn't dead. Because only death can pay for, di- for life and vice versa. So if I killed Marin Trant and these five people, then I would have stolen six deaths from the God of Death and I would have owed him six more. And this is evident in how Jack Nagar acts. He doesn't kill unless there's a purpose. So you can say, well, he didn't kill them, so maybe he is. I don't believe that, though. I just, I just don't believe a man of Serio's outlook on life and, and the honor he held and how, how much his diverse polyglot nature of a bravosi man. There's no way that Serio would have stopped until you killed him. He would have, even if he would have escaped from Marin Trant and those five men, his honor would have had him seek out Aya and seek out Ned Stark and stand with them because those are the people that he's endeared to. He's the first sword of Bravos, which means we do not run. And there's only one thing, as you heard my intro, <laughs> not today. So he would have told him not today until it was today. So that in itself is a reason why I don't believe that Serio survived, even if you just look at the information that the show gave you. Because the honor in this man would not have allowed him to leave Aya until his breath left his body. Now, let's look at Jagan Agar. While Jagan Agar may have, from your view, took a unnecessary interest in I, I, I just don't believe that. I believe he was an honorable man from Bravos, even though he was a killer. He understood honor and understood there was something special about this girl, but I owe you my life. And now that I know your life, I feel I owe something else on the deal. I feel that we met for a reason. What that reason is, only the God will let us know. His many faces are always looking in all directions. So while I like this, I like the whole debate because that's how you can tell something is great and affects a lot of people. I have to go back to the book and reference A Song of Ice and Fire where they are absolutely not the same person. And it is implied and confirmed that Serio did perish. Now, how did he perish? (laughs) Definitely not by swordsmanship. Someone stabbed him in the back. I think they all five got it. I think he he disabled them. He understood that he wasn't leaving that room. Even if he was to grab one of their swords, he is not versed in the broadsword, and he looks down upon it. Now, could he have had a real sword somewhere? Probably not. These were not his chambers. It was just a room where he would meet Aya. So all he did have was that wooden half of sword at the end. And when he looks at Sir Marin, I can see it. He's leaving, but he's going to take out as many people as he can and try to give Aya the time it takes. Now, he could have escaped easily. He could have gone. But the honor in this man would not allow him to because if I had escaped, they would have caught her. So I got to give her the best chance I can. Now, me not being from Westeros, I can't get her out of here. I can't even escape the Red Keep. But what I can do is give her a chance. And that's what he did. And because of that sacrifice that he made on that day, eight seasons later, seven seasons, 
Arya Stark kill the Night King. So while Game of Thrones has many, many, many stars and many, many, many heroes, he is one of the greatest and most unsung because that sacrifice saved Westeros. Amazing, people. Amazing. Now, I will be doing an entire series on the Faceless Men, and we're going to reference the book and the show because there are a lot of things I've done in my re- um, I found in my research that were not presented in the show that can change your opinion on the whole House of Black and White and their whole agenda. But we're not going to get into that today. <laughs> I enjoyed going over this. I enjoyed researching this subject because it allowed me to live Milos's life. I watched those three episodes over and over and over again, and I read his parts over and over and over again. And it gave me so much more respect for the water dance and the free city of Bravos. It's not just about dollars and cents. There's a lot of honor and rich history. And I believe there's enough to really support another series. Are you listening, HBO? Are you listening, George R. R. Martin? Get me another series. But there's only one God. And that is death. And what do we tell death? Not today. <laughs>